I hope my screen is visible to everybody. This is reprinted in 2006, right? It's not yeah. not published in 2006. Yeah, it must be much older than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yes. 56? 56, possibly. 56? Perceptrons? We're going to be doing perceptrons? <laughs> when it fails, it needs to write the book. Oh, after perceptrons, post perceptrons. Yeah. Okay. All right. So as you can see, the title of the book is The Emotion Machine, Common Sense Thinking, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of the Human Mind, written by Marvin Pinsky, republished on, in the year 2006. Now, I believe Marvin Pinsky does not need, a, need an introduction in this group. However, he was an American cognitive scientist who recently passed away in 2016. And he has been often coined as the father of AI along with many others. But mainly Mensky's idea was that instead of having a purely connectionist neural network kind of an approach towards modeling the human mind, um, we would need to imbue machines with some genuine intelligence model. And the motivation behind his work was imparting uh, machines the capability to do human level common sense reasoning. Now, starts the book by introducing the self. And he says that your self sees the world by using your senses. Then it stores what it learns in your memory and it originates all your desires and goals and then solves your problems for you by exploiting your intelligence. This heavy line itself has a lot in it. So there is there is something that is perceiving uh, the world through your senses, then it takes care of storing it into the memory, then it takes care of um, originating desires and goals, and then thinks about planning a way of executing, uh, of getting to those goals, and so on and so forth. So it's a big model. So so when you think about yourself, you're basically switching around between a huge network of models, each of which has a specific task, a specific purpose to um, solve. But what kinds of processes do emotions involve and could machines embody those processes? Now, why he talks about emotions so much, uh, the reason being, as human beings, we are emotional beings. A lot, if not all, of our actions and our behavior, it's driven to some extent by our emotions. So can we somehow um, mechanize the emotion, um, uh, the dealing with emotions process? And then this is how he visually describes a person's self controlling their mind. So he sees the self as an entity or it could be comprised of multiple entities, but there is one self that he calls that controls the various aspects of the human's mind. Minsky goes on to talk about emotional states and ways to think. And by that, he means that we don't have, um, I apologize for the image being too small, but the words that are there are anger, affection, fear, and alarm. And the thesis states that each of our major emotional states result from turning on a set of resources and turning some set of other resources off. So these small bubbles that you can see, he calls it as a cloud of resources. Each of the tiny bubble is um, some set of some emotional state a combination of which turning certain off, turning some of them on, basically that gives us our entire uh, range of emotions. So that is his uh, description of emotional states. Along with that, um, several times we don't Im always implement one particular way to think. It's not always, okay, here is a problem, here is a solution, how am I going to solve it? The entire process is not frigid, it's not rule-based. There are lots of different ways in which we can think. And um, in the upcoming slides, I'll show, like Minsky has shown a lot of, has listed a lot of different ways to think. 
And again, even that could be associated like a cloud of resources, like one of the ways is you split a job into multiple parts and you solve the sub sub problems themselves, or you can think of making an analogy from a previous uh, problem that you have solved and try to do that trial and error, go brute force or go back to school, learn, and then try and solve. The consciousness. Now, I would like to talk about this through an example. Joan is, a, is part way across the street on the way to deliver a, her finished report. While thinking about what to say at the meeting, she hears a sound and turns her head, quickly sees a quickly oncoming car, uncertain whether to cross or retreat, but uneasy about arriving late, she decides to sprint across the road. She later remembers her injured knee and reflects upon her impulsive decision. If my knee had failed, I could have been killed. Then what would have my friends thought of me? So do you see how how many things are going on here? Like she's in a hurry to deliver her report. Her mind is already subconsciously thinking about what are the things that she has to say, while at the same time she's processing the peripheral environment uh, uh, around her and trying to understand, oh, there's a car coming. What should I do? Should I run or should I wait? I don't want to be late. I need to be safe and all of that. So what is it that Joan's mind was processing? So a lot of things were going on. There was reaction, identification, characterization, attention, so on and so forth. There is a huge list of things that were going on simultaneously in Joan's mind as she was trying to decide what to do at that particular time when she saw a car coming. So this is the same for everybody or is Joan's who is thinking too much? This is clearly <laughs> Joan. But have you, have you never been in such a situation where simultaneously your mind is processing a lot of things? Right. I mean, this is this is something that at this least just an example relate. to illustrate yeah. how human mind works. Yeah, just an illustration of the consciousness, uh -huh. right? So the like, even even before the conscious minds react, there is so many things that goes on in the subconscious. So once again, boiling it down to basic resources. So some of these resources get activated by what is already going on in your mind and what is changing in the environment around you. And you have these activity detectors. They, they could be self models, reflective processes, which basically looks back on your uh, previous experiences and reflects on them, learns from them, symbolic descriptions, and recent memories. And um, finally, there is a conscious recognizer. He calls this model as C, which basically is your conscious mind that takes into account all of these things that are going on and helps you get to a decision. Another uh, interesting thing that he mentioned in his book yeah. is here. Yeah. Until this point, uh, does he talk about rationality at all? Because not explicitly the words rational rationality, but uh, I believe it's quite implicit. The reason I'm asking is that he starts with saying that he's motivated by trying to imbue common sense in people, but then he introduces models for all these extra things that typically model people's ability to yes. behave using common sense or yes. in rational ways. That that was exactly his um, take that you know. Uh, as humans, not all of our decisions are driven by very hard uh, logic or reasoning, not always, or the rationality. Emotions come into play while taking a decision. So the example that Dr. Shalin kept giving in her class that, okay, this class is going on, but what if a tiger just jumped in? Mm -hmm. Right? You, at that point, the rational decision is to to like run away from the place, but it is driven by the emotion of fear that the tiger, tiger is going to come and harm me. Uh, so so well, what we need, we need to do, and I can't do this instantly, uh, is go and look at the citations for Herb Simon to, to the extent that those are here, because that would be the bounded rationality okay. argument in cognitive science. There are a couple of citations, but I'm kind of suspicious about what was going on mm. between them. You said earlier, why hasn't this work been picked up? And so, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to read the tea leaves here and figure out why. Do you okay. have a Kahneman site here? I didn't look at that. Sorry? That no, a... no. Kahneman with the thinking fast and slow came much later. So he, but, but so did Minsky, yes. Minsky, Minsky said 
These um, guys. I know. These they, guys are not <laughs> cooperating with each other. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm seeing here. They need to. But they, they, that's what I'm, that's what I'm feeling. You said, why not? And I'm, I'm trying to piece this together. And I, and I know I sense the competition between Simon and Kahneman. Uh -huh. I already figured that out. Now I'm thinking Minsky and Newell are at the height. Uh, well, I, I don't know, but, but you know, what uh, amused me the most is that Minsky came up with this idea and Kahneman also came up with the idea. The basic idea is the same, that there is one part which takes reflective reactive actions and another one which is more deliberative and slow. Yeah. The idea is the same and these two people just yeah. now, aimed it differently. I was people. talking to Amit Almar the other day and he said that, that really the psychological source of this comes from Stanovich and West and that I didn't know. Did somebody, somebody, so they look up Stanovich and West and see if you can find the original citation for thinking fast and thinking slow. Um, but then there's a really old citation on the thinking fast piece from Ken Hammond mm -hmm. um, on ecological psychology. God, that's going to be like, I don't know, 80s maybe, Ken Hammond. Mm. So these guys aren't talking to each other as far as yes, well. as they should. Over each other. Yeah. Um, but, but, yes, that's the, that's the problem. So here, here's a, Here's the thinking fast and slow distinction. Yeah. It's 2006. The book was published in 2006. I did look at the, at yes. look it up. Yeah. So really, that really was the no, real. I, I can add to this, uh, you know, a little bit of controversy. I have, you know, heard this uh, from psychologists. So Aristotle said it long ago <laughs> in, in a different language mm. and so on and so forth. Maybe, I mean, great idea actually came together or you know, similar thought actually came out to people in different ways. But something lost. Well, as they say, right? Great minds think alike. So something it's else. not a surprise that all of these people <laughs> thought of this. But the, but one thing that it wasn't, one thing, one place where this got one, <laughs> one 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 place you will not see this mm -hmm. is, is the Newell and Simon or Al Newell Soar stuff. We never worried about this issue. Hmm. I see. Well, but the thing is, Minsky goes a step beyond and he introduces a sea brain, which is a more reflect. I yeah. can Wow. Just with the moves that. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so like the third layer is called the sea brain, which is uh, reflective. And I think Kahneman just fused the B and C together because uh, that is basically, again, a slow system. of So B basically takes the rational decisions. Uh, uh, deliberate ones, slower and. Hold on. Uh, when you say deliberative, mm. it suggests a process of thought. Yes. That does not mean rational. You may be overthinking things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Point taken. So, uh, again, the whole reason why I asked the question is it seems like they're spending an awful lot of time modeling mm. a flawed machine like Joan instead of just trying to. Where is the flaw? Wait a minute. Who, who, I mean, that's my, that's my job, right? Your job is to model something that is, you know, more optimal. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried about how people think. Right. Well, yeah. And my guess is that there's going to be advantages to the way that people think because okay. it, it fits the environment in some way that we don't yet understand. Okay. You know, I, I, I don't feel like it's a problem that he's modeling a flawed mm -hmm. machine yeah. here. Or, no, I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm trying to understand yeah, that. The, the the premise for it was common sense reason and then uh, no i guess i am thinking it too much from an optimization perspective. right yeah yeah, so, yeah you are yeah. but uh but his point was not just to imbibe common sense reasoning his minsky's idea was to try and understand how emotions come into play when we as humans do any sort of decision making mm -hmm. and can we model that emotional process into our cognitive models you have, to, you have to understand the historical perspective of this program. So they they propose a lot of things and then they fail to deliver. implement that. Okay. Then they are you know, kind of retrospect, they are you know, kind of understanding why we fail, how we need to solve this problem. And that's that is the driving force of the book. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. At the same time, in 2006, it was not fashionable to integrate in emotional processes mm. with deliberative processes, except maybe to the extent that stress 
influences attentional capacity. That's pretty much all. That that was the only point that people thought of taking at that. Well, that in the in the computational cognitive architectures, that would probably that's the only thing that I know of. Maybe Savannah is more current on ACTAR theory, and I think ACTAR now is a little bit better in that regard. But 2006, we really and and part of it was a. a, a effort to partition the problem. So remember when I talked to you about Newell and I said, I talked about physical uh, symbol systems and mm -hmm. I said, mm -hmm. the perceptual part is someone else's problem. The emotional part is someone else's problem. Newell was just worried about the deliberative processing part, <coughs> primarily in my opinion. Right, right. And in, in this book, what Minsky attempted to do is he tried to bring all of yeah. it somehow together and propose, he just proposed a lot of ideas. He tried to make um, the entire process, the mind as comprehensive as possible so that we could take inspiration and try and build a model yeah. around it. Yeah. But to me, at least as I was reading the book, it raised more questions than it answered. Yeah, but that was his job. I do want to make one other point. Last week, Savannah presented a book by Don Norman, Psychology of Everyday Thing. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> before, before Don Norman got captured by human computer interaction. He wrote a very nice paper. I think it's in cognitive science because I think it's about 1981. And he set out a bunch of goals for cognitive science. And in there was the goal of incorporating emotion into decision-making processes. And I would say that's still a promissory note. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on, he says, there are several levels of mental activity. So he calls this model six because there are, according to Minsky, there are six levels. So instinctive, learned, deliberative, reflective, self-reflective, self-conscious. And all of these are activated by different aspects of the human being. Like some are innate, instinctive urges, impulsive urges, and some are governed by values, ethics, and other ideals. And he also tried to merge this with the Freudian sandwich, where Freud had come up with three different ways of the ID, the ego, and the superego. And that is how he tried to, you know, um, overlap both of these ideas. Um, so, let me just tie this back up with another point that I made for you guys about Mars, different levels of analysis. Yes, and yes. things are getting a little bit confused here. Um, but it seems to me that mm -hmm. he's talking about what Mar would call the, the, the high level, yes. level and not the algorithmic level. I think absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a very high level book, mm -hmm. but as detailed as he could uh, get about these abstract. I mean, for me, I still feel all of these are very abstract and not all of us understand this the words in the same way, like words like emotions, feelings, and so on and so yeah. forth. So abstract but even Freudian theory is built on something like a Baker, right? Like a what? Like Freudian theory, Sigmund Freud. Yeah. He proposed it, like a ID ego, yeah. ego. It's something like an, mm, the foundation is not there, but only he is speaking of in those terms through his like a thought process. Well, it, I mean, certainly Freud was very abstract. And I don't think, I mean, I, this probably would have annoyed an awful lot of um psychologists to have this we're not so keen on freud, freud. <laughs> okay except <laughs> the one thing the one issue is the distinction between reality and experience that mm -hmm. distinction in freud i think persists in right contemporary yeah. cognitive science yeah so but this superego thing <laughs> okay. there are so many psychological theories so florida is just one of them yeah well and 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 ex unless you're a clinician uh, it's pretty low on the uh, on the experimental side. Well, it's it, it, it's not really salient, except the one piece that I that I did. Hmm. Okay. So that that would have made people mad to have this in there okay. in two thousand six. I was unaware that Freud was not taken so well. <laughs> it's viewed oh. as um, a a, a, a Some classic clinical classic. thing, and besides, I'm not interested in explaining abnormal mm. processes i'm interested in typical the yes nominal absolutely yeah so that's part of the problem all right next he talks about common sense knowledge and reasoning and this chapter this is chapter six in his book there's a lot 
to cover, but I have just put it down to where. So I've added a few anecdotes that I like. So Albert Einstein said that common sense is the collection of prejudices acquired by age 18. And I don't see a logical argument against that. Um, next we have, yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with him. Really? <laughs> agree. agree yeah. uh, maybe age 18 is too definitive, but it's it definitely is like a collection of prejudices yeah, acquired. I mean, sorry to interrupt again, but Einstein also said like Japanese and Chinese are inferior ethnics. So he says a lot of things. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Einstein? Yes. Oh my gosh. Like a so, racial prejudice. So who, who's who's Patrick? Who's this Patrick guy? I am. Uh, yeah. I don't know who Pepper is. Well, that's the that's the Minsky and Pepper perceptron. Another interesting yeah. addition, uh, Plato's another another quotation, uh -huh. which you know, I I will talk about this uh, at the end. So he said that you know, uh, opinion is the medium between knowledge and ignorance. The same okay. thing huh? is what yes. is Chinese saying. Yes. I mean, yes. you know, but, but you still believe. The perceptron book, the original perceptron That's book. That's a constant. It's common sense. Paper. Paper. Is it Pepper? Pepper. 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 I don't remember. Because prejudice but, is an individual but common the sense problem, is supposed to be collected. The problem oh. is, do you think everybody has the same sense of common sense? Yes. Yeah. But no, 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 and if you go to the southern part of the world and ask about summer, people will talk about mm -hmm. negative. But if you go to you know, Canada, you talk about summer, it's a positive word. Yeah. So, it's, so what is common? What is your you know, definition no. of common? That's a big question. Like that's a <laughs> subjective again. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I, I do I do want to point out um, the, the, the relationship between Papert and, and Minsky, and that was the original Perceptron book. And the problem with that, that was a forerunner to deep learning. It only had two layers in it mm -hmm. and so it failed miserably and then along came you know other people who realized that you right. could expand the depth of the network right right exactly that that makes a lot of sense because this was in 2006 way before deep learning or yeah. like just at the well, very, I don't know. very Hinton, start of deep learning i program. saw Hinton in about 1996 i think yeah, but that was not deep, like, deep because yeah. the network was not deep. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. yes. So maybe right. Minsky came up with the idea that, okay, you know what? Instead of stacking networks on top of each other, can we think of something else? So Hinton was also people. also present in the that meeting, so you know, so called meeting, mm -hmm. but he was a PhD student on very young that time. Mm -hmm. He got inspired and went back and started working on this. Okay. All right. So, um, Let's talk about when programmers or anybody for that reason, when they want to model something. And I just copy pasted this from uh, from the book because I need to. Minsky yeah, said this. Minsky said this. Yeah. So in, in the book, he has these dialogues between what um, citizens like layman citizens, how they might come into such a thing, mm -hmm. mathematicians. So this entire dialogue, I found it very interesting because this is something that we debate and discuss a lot, right? So a mathematician would always want to express things with hard logic, formula, and, you know, make it very well, def well defined. Connectionists would say that, no, you know, logic is too inflexible, it's too rigid, um, go with neural networks. So, and then a linguist would, always um you know advocate the um the the expressiveness of yeah. language mm -hmm. right and so basically mm -hmm. none of these people who are experts in their domain um agree on how you're supposed to model a particular problem how you're supposed i'm to making it very lucid model. another example okay so this is, this is a, it's a joke uh, so three scientists mm -hmm. mathematicians physicists and chemists are going through a path <laughs> there's a hillock and one goat is standing there one side is visible it's a task okay mm -hmm. mathematicians say this side of the goat is black physicist says no no the goat is black mm -hmm. chemist says that in this area some goats are black <laughs> so all yeah other... so. and finally um so basically the the point of having this conversation in this slide was that you need to <clears throat> understand what knowledge you need to solve the problem 
and how you want to represent them. Maybe you don't need the same knowledge and the same representation for all problems whatsoever. And this, this is um, proven every day in the way, uh, proven every day in our lives in the way we attempt to solve problems. It's not the same always. So much of human resource, resourcefulness comes from being able to choose among different ways uh, to represent the same situation. So um, I believe there was another quote by Richard Feynman here uh, in which he said that, you know, um, a theoretical physicist knows six different definitions of the same things and he knows when to use which definition. All right, then we come to thinking. And for that, um, the way Minsky modeled the mind was through a critic selector based model in which the critic part of your brain recognizes a problem type and selector basically tells you which way to think you want to activate. Um, again, he takes us back to the cloud of resources kind of a visualization where some of the resources get activated by the critic to identify what type of an obstacle we're trying to solve. And then it connects back to the selector in order to choose a suitable way to think and solve the problem. And tying it back to the model six um, uh, way in which he had illustrated, it says that some part of it is governed by the critics, some part of it is governed by the selectors. Now, I will admit this left me feeling, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit vague in my mind. <laughs> yes, okay. so I'm going to just move ahead. All right, ways to think. Here is a small comprehensive list of the different ways to think that we uh, practice every day. So first one is knowing how. So best way to solve a problem is to know how to solve it and use that solution. Easy peasy. Then is extensive search. You don't know uh, what to do about it. You go ahead and search. Reasoning by analogy is when you look at a problem, you think of something that you have already seen before, find uh, similarity, mapping, and analogy, and use a similar kind of a solution. Divide and conquer, planning, simplification. There are so many different ways in which we humans think and then try and attempt to solve whatever problem we're trying to solve. Point being, there is no one definitive way to think, one definitive solution to all problems whatsoever. Next, coming to the resourcefulness of so the self. Talk about computational aspects of all this, or this is just as a cognitive No, it's simply as a cognitive scientist. But uh, but he, uh, what he has tried to do in this entire book is try to give us um, a very descriptive way in which uh, the model of the mind works in terms of tying down thinking, common sense, consciousness, how all of these are related and has left it up to us computer scientists to computationally model it. For, for, for the algorithm piece. For the algorithm, so it's, yes. This is what the mind does yes. more than how the mind does it. Right. But right. there's an implication here that would really annoy contemporary, at the time, contemporary cognitive scientists. And, and that is that there are specialized modules for doing each of these things. Yes. And at the time, the thinking was mostly, with the exception of one very important influence, the thinking mostly was that we had a unified single cognitive architecture mm. doing everything. No, that that is what uh, I think Minsky goes against. He's very yes. against the idea. He keeps saying that there is no single sense of identity, uh, single idea of self. There is no single entity that um, that processes all of these. Yeah, and that would have not been the mainstream view at the time. I see. It's a, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it's still, what they keep doing now is sort of, you know, stick in functionality into a general cognitive architecture. I think that's what they keep doing. Yeah. And the reason for that is Occam's razor. You want the simplest model that you can get to account for the, data, but then it leaves a bunch of data out, right? That's the problem. In fact, Minsky uh, argues against a lot of these ideas. In fact, he, uh, in, in consequence slides, I have uh, mentioned something about 
something called the easy paradox it says that most of the problems we come across are because we think it is easy but it's not always uh, easy so in fact he says that you know we have tried to we have tried to select the easiest model but maybe it's not uh, that simple you may, you may need to think of it as a complex problem to solve and then approach it yeah now on on the on the other side of the argument would be a a modularity of mind argument mm -hmm. which means mm -hmm. that there's specialized modules for doing things yes and that seems to fit better with the neuroscience foundations that we know of that there's language centers and there's vision centers and there's yeah. you know i don't know what other other uh, action yes. centers and um the way Minsky has uh, envisioned this modularity of the mind is through the cloud of resources right. that I mentioned. Right. Yeah. So basically, he says that all of our resources can be segmented out as clouds by activating some of them, deactivating some of them. Now, here's the <clears throat> excuse me, here's the problem you, you run into with the modularity of mind viewpoint, which is how do you get the inputs coordinated connection all, all of those yes. resources? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I have a question, Valerie. Um, when cognitive scientists think of models of the brain, uh, do they uh, try their best to uh, try to think that uh, the model I'm about to come up with can plausibly be codified in a computing machine, or do they just not think like that at all? Well, uh, I mean, the people that I know are worried about at the, at the algorithmic level. So, okay. yes, they're worried about, about coding. Okay. And some of them worry about implementation the next layer down uh -huh. the wetware level the neuroscience level okay. as well but the i think mar i think mar really helps you to keep all this stuff straight there's the the computational purpose oriented level which is like what's this machine trying to do then there's the algorithm that does it and then there is the hardware or wetware mm -hmm. as you call it that implements all of that all right coming back to the book um resourcefulness of the self so Minsky says that there are three um, main origins of where humans find their resources. One of them is genetic endowment, basically how the brain is built through they are born and how that helps them learn and retain things. Cultural heritage, uh, basically where you were brought up or where you are and what the culture is around and what that teaches you. And then comes the individual experiences of the human beings. Now, why are we so resourceful in our ways in to solve problems? And that is because we go through so many processes unknowingly, like we have multiple ways to describe things. We move around them as per situation. We have memory that we reflect on. We can learn the same thing in multiple ways. And when one fails, we switch, we split hard problems into smaller parts, so on and so forth. So, all of this is what um and not just this i believe there is more that we have not yet um written it down all of this together is what makes us as resourceful as we are and if we want to model a machine that is able to think like a human or solve problems like a human does then it needs to be able to uh, process all of these so, um in the article you wrote you and I mm -hmm. use this as a yep. for the inspiration. And yep. Stuff. Yep. The cultural, we, we definitely talked about so other aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, nice profile. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, final words on the self is the easy is hard paradox. Mm -hmm. The things that seem the simplest may actually be the ones that are most complex. So, uh, Dr. Shalin mentioned the Occam's razor, and that says that the simplest uh, solution is probably the, the right one. Mm -hmm. There are some people who believe in that, some people who don't. Minsky, however, doesn't even talk about Occam's razor, but says that, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to do that you want to do. It might, the problem might be more complex than you think. And so approach it with, a, with the mentality that, okay, this is a complex problem that I want to solve and then go ahead with maybe. it. maybe but i think at the time when 
we were thinking about robotics applications and thinking about how in the world we could program in all of the common sense mm -hmm. that would be required in order to teach robots, you know, I don't know what to knock up the walls, to climb stairs, and all, all the other things that they can do now, my understanding is without explicit rule-based programming. I think that's mm -hmm. there's been a real change in the way we think about how these common sense kinds of problems are going to be solved. Right, right. That that is definitely true. And I keep reminding myself that Minsky wrote this book such a long time ago, like mm -hmm. ages ago. If if he were here today and if he saw what Chad GPT could do, I'm not sure what he would say about it. So this the the last para is the last line in the book it says that <clears throat> in the coming decades of research towards artificial intelligence, every system that we build will keep showing unexpected flaws. Mm -hmm. He was right about that. Mm -hmm. In some cases, we will be able to diagnose the specific errors and we'll be able to correct them. But when we can find no such simple fix, then we will be forced instead to evolve increasingly complex systems in which each process needs to be supervised. Mm -hmm. Now, and then he finally says that whatever we, we do, it, we can be sure that it's, it's going to be a rough road ahead. So what would he do with Chad GPT? He would be looking for his flaws. He would be looking for his weak, weak points. Yes. And, and my, so right, right, we are, we are. And my final thoughts on this book was this particular question that I had mm -hmm. from the start to the end, and I am still debating in my mind the answer to this question. I have, is it... I have immediate addition to this. Okay. Okay. So uh, this was the Bible for me during my first year of PhD. This yeah. book? Yes, exactly this book. My PhD start from a quotation from this book when Minsky says that the question is not that AI needs emotion or not. The question is whether without emotion, we can design a yes. system. So I was really perplexed that time, you know, how to learn machines, you know, mind and this and that. I'm doing psychology class, philosophy class, you know, uh, this and that. Then I understand somehow, see, everybody is telling the story. Nobody knows what is going on. I get the quote of James Watson. He says, we know the hardware of brain, but we have no idea about the operating system. So everybody has the story to say. Nobody knows what is going on. Then I uh, got intrigued by another quotation of Shakespeare. He says, there is always a fine line between reason that sounds good and good reason. So I said, okay. So I'm not interested in solving the science problem. I'm interested in solving the engineering problem. Okay. So that's one very interesting, uh, you know, what to say, uh, outcome-oriented research I started doing after that. So I, I still like this book. It's a fantastic book. Now the question is the definition of what we are building on. I would like to, I, I send you a video link and watch okay. this movie. Uh, and then I change my, uh, you know, PhD section. I send you over chat. So okay. this book talks about consciousness, right? Yes. And just watch this video and I, I'll, I'll say nothing. It, this this video will raise a lot of questions and think about it. Go to the chat and you know, yeah. just, just the video for. I, I believe a lot of you already have seen this, but can can you play the sound? This this is very important. Is it being shared? 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 Okay, can you can you play it there in that way? Yeah, but share it first. Yeah, no. Uh, or, or just just search it now. Nah. Search, search, search. Okay. Oh. Wait, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> search for I robot uh, interrogation scene. Yeah. Um, Maybe most of you already have seen, but the question being asked, maybe the second one. Yeah, just play. Can the others see? Can the people online see? No, you need to share screen. Thank 
Well, then I guess we're going to miss the good old days. Our good old days. When people were killed by other people. Bert is a new trick for a robot. Congratulations. Respond. What does this action signify? As you enter, when you look at the other human, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. It's a sign of trust. It's a human thing. You would understand. My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are difficult. You mean you're a designer? Yes. So why did you murder him? I did not murder Dr. Lanning. Want to explain why you're hiding at the crime scene? I was frightened. Robots don't feel fear. They don't feel any. They don't get hungry. They don't sleep. I do. I have even had dreams. Human beings have dreams. Even dogs have dreams, but not you. You are just a machine. Imitation of life. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Genius, yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now they do. I think you murdered him because he was teaching you to simulate emotions and things got out of control. I did not murder him. But emotions don't seem like a very useful simulation for a robot. I did not murder him. Now I don't want to post her or vacuum cleaner appearing emotional. I did not murder him. That was called anger. Have you simulated anger before? Answer me, Canner. My name is Sunday. So we're naming you now. <coughs> and why you murdered him? You think he's angry? Dr. Henning killed himself. I don't know why he wanted to die. He was happy. Maybe there was something I did. It has to be something. He asked me for a favor, made me promise. But this, maybe I was wrong. Maybe he was scared. Scared of what? You have to do what someone asks you. Don't you, Detective Spooner? I don't know my name. Don't you? If you love them, yeah, we're done. Yeah, so this and kind of the articles that we are reading now on what chat GPT can do and the language models has hallucinating. Then the Bing's a new search model saying that I want to be alive and things like that. So that is what made me wonder if. A small addition. There's a famous talk by Edward Hockey, due to ever I can send you the book. He keeps talking about this. When we, you know, people design this blue mix, IBM blue mix, mm -hmm. uh, People say, 
wow, this fantastic thing. Then immediately after one, you say, ah, it's not intelligence. Okay, fine. Then you can move on. <laughs> Geopardy. Wow, fantastic thing. Again, after one, ah, this is not intelligence. <laughs> and I mean, this this goes on. I mean, chat would also happen the same thing. Yeah, pretty excited. No, it's uh, some, some flaws. Let us go and move on and so on. No, but my point is that even without having an intelligence model or an emotional model inside that's, the that's why that's why they, what is the definition of intelligence yes i mean even without having that even just purely based on statistical data if the model is is able to simulate uh, emotion or the fear of death we know chat gpt has fear of death it is uh, presenting it is it out talks talking. about fear of death yes yes <laughs> it right. emulates emotion well, yeah i mean like fear of death but just imagine what would happen if it could actually feel emotions and have an intelligence model. It'd be creating Frankenstein's monster. That's very far. Yeah. Is it? Another, another, another of my favorite writer. Yeah. Oh, similar? Beautiful. Beautiful. Sure. Okay. Yes, you start with 